Hello, welcome to today's Saturday sit down and we are sitting down outside. There is beautiful weather here in Virginia and I want you to get some of it. So here you go. I started a new book. It's called The Long Grief Journey by Pamela Blair and Bride Hansen. I just started reading it and the book is very interesting. It is geared towards people who have been grieving two years or longer, but there are some good tips if you are recently in the grief journey. And I wanna offer an opportunity to have it as a book club. It's pretty decent sized book, a lot of good information. And I wanna meet with you once a month available on Zoom. So if you're interested in reading the book with me, email me at widowhoodrealtalk at gmail.com. And then I can set up a schedule of when we can do, yeah, I'm outside so people are walking by. <laughs> so we can set up a schedule of everyone that wants to read the book and have the conversation. Once again, it's The Long Grief Journey by Pamela Blair and Br Bride Hansen. And I just started reading, so the first book club get together will be sometime in May, depending on people who email me. So that is widowhoodrealtalk at gmail.com. And we'll start meeting in May. So give me an email. Second, if you're interested in sharing your story on Widowhood Real Talk with Tina on the podcast, send me an email. We want to hear your story. We are in the place of the conversation where I am looking to speak to authors people that have written books about grief, if you feel like you know maybe a funeral home director, someone dealing in pre-needs, or any other things, social security administration, finances, things that would be helpful for the Widowhood community, please email me your recommendations. So let's get into this week's conversation. This week's interview was with my girlfriend, Chris Wisman. And Chris, I love how all my friends are just so different. They are some really caring and supportive women, but they all have different personalities because we are different. And so there are different people in your hood. My conversation with Chris was different because of her faith and the people that Chris has lost. Chris has lost her brother. She only had one sibling, so that is really significant. And both of her parents. So Chris is the only one in her immediate family that is still living. And that is a different scenario altogether also. And my friendship with Chris has so many twists and turns. And I just want to talk about some of those if you allow me time. So the one thing that Chris loves talking about is how I met her husband. Chris's husband's name is Mark, which is the same as my husband. And her husband's Mark birthday was June 2nd. My I'm sorry, her husband's Mark birthday is June 2nd. And my husband's Mark birthday was June 1st. So their birthdays were literally back to back. On top of that, both of our birthdays, Chris and mom, we both share a birthday in May. So there was a lot of similarity there. But Chris's husband Mark and I went to Christopher Newport University for our undergrad. And we were in a group called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And we just, we were older students because I went into the military after being in the army for over five and a half years. And Chris's husband, Mark, was in the Navy. So when we met in InterVarsity, there was a lot to connect with as far as being in the military, being an older student, and being able to just relate on different levels. Being in the military, there's a lot of activity going on, a lot of exercise and things like that. So her husband, Mark, and I met with the idea of thinking, wow, we could go play racquetball together. My husband, Mark, was not interested in getting up early to go play racquetball. Neither was her husband. So neither was Mark's wife, which was Chris, was not interested in getting up early to go play racquetball either. So the idea of us both being in the military, uh, both liking to get up early, both interested in just having fun, it seemed like a good connection. And we would get to play racquetball before our spouses woke up and it was even a thing. So we got up early and we would go play racquetball. My husband did not stir, he did not care. He was like, if you have somebody that wants to go play racquetball with you and I don't have to be involved, I'm in for it. Now, Chris, on the other hand, realized that her husband is going to meet up with ladies early in the morning, something about that. She just wanted to, you know, settle in. So one day I went to 
pick up Mark for racquetball and I was waiting downstairs and I was waiting longer than normal. And I finally was like, is this dude going to play racquetball or not? Or, or is he just, you know, gaffing me around? There's bugs outside too. <laughs> so I finally get upstairs and I was like, all right, I think he told me his apartment number and I went and knocked on the door and I was trying not, not to knock too loud because I knew he had a wife and they were probably asleep, and, which is why. He was playing racquetball with me because she didn't get up. So I knocked on the door and sure enough, this lady comes to answer. I was like, hey, she's like, hi. And she like had her RBF face on. And I was like, okay. I was like, and I'm like, it's early in the morning. I'm all, you know, fired up. And I'm like, hey, my name is Tina. She's like, hi. And I was like, Ooh, okay, awkward. And I was like, hey, I'm here to pick up Mark. And she was like, and she just started low-key drilling me with questions and doing stuff and I answered them all and she did release Mark and we did go play racquetball but over time uh, we would start having uh, different get-togethers in each other's homes and I got to know Chris more and she became more interested in Mark but it's funny sometimes when I come over Mark is pretty low-key and quiet and I can get him to talk sometimes in ways that he just doesn't talk a lot so she'll use me sometimes to make him chitter chat a little bit more on a particular subject, but we're not gonna tell Mark about that. <laughs> so the adventures of Chris and I. I am not very artistic or creative. So when I came over to Chris's house and saw, oh, so this day I have a whole memo pad, not just a little sheet of paper. So if we're outside, I didn't want something to blow away and stuff like that. So I brought a whole sheet of paper. So jewelry making seemed really interesting to me and it seemed like something I could actually do with my less than favorable creative skills. So I went over to Chris's house one day and she was, I think she was doing it with one of her children and she had taken, ear, taken buttons and figured out how to affix them to the backings and make earrings. And I was like, well, aren't you just creative? And I was like, so then here I am ordering a pair. I was like, can you make me a pair of earrings? And she was like, oh, I could do that. And then after she made them, then after time went on, I was like, then she showed me how to make the earrings. And I was making them with her. And I was like, oh, we could do this. And then we could do a craft show. The way she made it sound like it was like the first time I saw her making earrings and I went full in on to we're going to do this whole production. It was casual. It was over time. It wasn't like the first go around. But she did do some craft shows with me. And I'm going to see if I can find those pictures and post those. And I do have a couple of pair of the earrings and I'll share those with you too. It may not be with the Saturday sit down. It may be something separate, but I will look for those pictures. But it was so much fun. We went to craft shows, we sold earrings, we had a stamp that said Christina's putting our name together. And we had aprons and we would make those. I sold those at school, I sold those at church. I was like the ear uh, pandling, selling person everywhere I could go. Cause we were in college still trying to make money and do thing, anything possible to get a dime. And it was fun. And it was like the first time I ever did something like creative. And that actually uh, sparked my creative skills. And then I went from there and I actually started doing some cross stitching. So I thank Chris for helping ignite my creativity that did not exist before. The other thing was, oh my gosh, that road trip. And I don't even like driving long distance. Let's just be clear. But I wanted to see Mark. I wanted to see him so bad because he traveled as an electrician and being able to spend some time with him and then take our daughter because at this point I was a stay at home mom and just sort of low key work in my accounting business and I was in the army reserve so I had flexibility in my schedule. It allowed me to go visit with my family in Chicago and visit with Mark but the road trip getting there, <laughs> buckets of experience altogether, buckets of, I didn't think that was gonna happen. And I, when I put Catherine, so we, we take this trip to uh, Wisconsin. And so we have to drive from Virginia. We were in Gloucester at the time, Chris comes and we pack up the kids and we leave. I don't know if her husband dropped her off or if she left her vehicle there. 
but we pack up the kids in my Jeep and we're, we're heading off. We're two stay-at-home moms and three children and we're about to take a road trip with our cell phones and we're just doing it. We have road maps and we're going. And we're driving and Chris says, um, has Catherine ever had peanut butter before? I was like, mm, I don't think so. And I was just driving, I just thought she was making up questions. But like by the third or fourth question, I was like, oh, something is happening. She goes, well, I think she's having an allergic reaction. I'm like, we are driving on the road. What are we gonna do? How's this gonna work? And I'm trying not to be frantic. I'm putting on my army officer hat and I'm like, okay, need to be focused. Where's the next hospital? How do we get there? What do we do? And we pull up to this uh, toll booth and we ask the person how far is the next hospital and what do we need to do? And it really wasn't that far. And they gave us some ointment for Catherine and it was not really a big ordeal. By the time we found a, a place to stay for the night, I was exhausted. The idea, I mean, like we left Virginia to West Virginia. We didn't get far people. If it was maybe five or six hours, and it was like the whole momentum for the trip was like wonk, 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 wonk. But it was like, all right, we're gonna go sleep and we're gonna start this over tomorrow. And when I put Catherine down and said, sweetie, it's been a long day. Mama's tired and you're tired. And I like you not to get up to like 8 a.m. so we can sleep. It was a hope, a dream, and a prayer that that child would stay asleep. But when I woke up and she was still asleep and I like looked at my watch and it was not even like that time yet, I was like, it worked. Now I looked over at Chris and her two kids and I saw a shade <laughs> and I saw a salty face. She was like, she's still asleep. I was like, Shh. she was like, I cannot believe that worked out. And I was like one to go, I know, right? <laughs> And Catherine got up and I was like, yay, go baby. <laughs> and then we went on the trip. And Chris and I talked so much between taking turns driving, watching the children. It just cemented our relationship even further. And I encourage you to step out. It may not look like someone would be the friend that you would have, but in time, you may find out that you'll be closer than you ever realized. And I am grateful for those adventures that cemented our friendship because it's still holding true today. So yeah, we get to uh, 7-Eleven and we're maybe, eh, maybe eight or nine hours out from where our destination is. And I remember going into that 7-Eleven and coming out with like the gigantic Slurpee because me and Sugar are way too close with each other. And I was like, hey, we're only such and such far away. Let's get going. And the look on her eye was like shock and awe. And I was like, I'm driving. I'm going to get there. We're going to do this. And she was like, okay. And I got in that car and I drove all the way there, dropped her off where she needed to go and got to see Mark. And it was wonderful. We were there for, I want to say like maybe about a week or so. I got to visit my family. Catherine was so small. We literally put her in a so adventure with the jewelry, adventure with uh, the road trip. The rest of life was pretty normal with Chris and I. So that was pretty cool. So for Chris, I want to rotate to Chris's grief. And it's a lot. It is a lot. And I really encourage you that as many people as we have in this world and we don't like to think about it, they only stay for so long. And we may not think about the idea of losing someone, but the community that we have, those friends and those great times, they become so valuable when life starts lifing. When Chris started losing people, I was in Pennsylvania, but had the opportunity to still support her. And I say that because you may have friends that you no longer live close to, but your ability to support them is not limited by your proximity. You can support them by sending texts. You can support them by phone calls. You can make a video and send it to your friend and let them know how much you love them and how much you care about them. You can send cards. You can be as creative as you want to allow yourself to show up in their life and let them know that you care about them. And that amount of love that you share with people will go a long way. 
because from my experience in talking to Chris about the passing of her dad, about the passing of her brother, everybody is there when the service happens. Everybody is there when all those initial parts of everything going on. But the reality of humanity, we go back to our lives. And if you take a moment to put in your phone that once a month I want to send this person an email or once a month I want to call them and reach out, it goes a long way. Because when you know people care, it reinforces to you that you are not alone in this journey. And if you are the person that is grieving, I encourage you to reach out to people that you know that you can talk candidly and express how challenging and how difficult this process is for you. Express to them, hey, I was watching this lady on a podcast or on this conversation in YouTube or Facebook or wherever you find this. And it was saying that, you know, she reached out and let her community know how important it was for them to be along the journey with her. And I would appreciate that type of support and give your friends and family permission to be able to be on this journey with you. And that will be helpful. Chris talked about the idea that death is not tidy. Ooh, child, if she did not say something with that, it is so messy. And every death is so different. The way Chris spoke about her dad passing and having cancer and deciding that the, treat, the path to treatment was not something that he thought was going to improve his quality of life or extend his life to be worth the treatment. And for their family to honor that, to be able to say, I accept your decision and to love on him and be with him in that process is beautiful. And then differently from that, Chris's brother was uh, plagued with so many complications in his body that eventually succumbed him. Uh, his wife, Lisa, being by his side, Chris coming in and out to be able to help and her mother being available to be able to assist and being there as he transitioned and taking his last breath. The beauty of death really can be as beautiful as life that's being honored. And being with Chris as she cared for her mother day and night in their home, I remember visiting her and being, to some extent, the comic relief or knowing that two doors down in the same house, her mom was literally coming to the end of her life and seeing my friend, her level of commitment to her mom being there. And let me say this, everybody's way of caring for their parents and their commitment is different. Some person's commitment to their parents may be in a facility because that's what they want and they're honoring their parents. Some people may have, may be the sibling of someone that's caring for their family member. Everybody's commitment and everybody's ability to take care of their family member is different. I am just sharing about Chris's. So I don't want that to be taken out of context because maybe your parents or loved one are in a care facility. Your commitment is just as strong as theirs. So let me go back to Chris. Being in their house and knowing that just literally two or three doors down that she is caring for her mother in such details that I would have never really thought about. It just made me respect her and honor her in a different way. And her husband and their family, the children, the way everybody was a part of that process some way or another. I now see what she meant by the beauty of death and what that looks like. It's not something that you would want to do, but at the same time when you're in it, is something that you can cherish. And I appreciate Chris's candor and being able to share that with us and to not hold back. And let me be clear, the conversation was painful, but I appreciate her investment in the widowhood and everyone that is grieving to be transparent and to share with you her experience. So when you hear the conversation, you know that you're not alone, that this is what grief looks like.
One of the other things that Chris talked about when we were speaking about my late husband's death is feeling like that she was so far away that she needed someone else to talk to. That she received information from my friends or maybe other people, but she needed to talk to me. That she needed to hear the tone in my voice. She needed to hear how I was speaking, what I was saying. And I, I can relate with that. It is so important. You can hear something from somebody else, but the desire to want to hear from your person and know exactly how they're feeling and exactly, like you, when you hear them talking, you can like almost see them. And that is really important. So I say that to say sometimes you may not get to hear directly from your person. You may not get to connect with them because so much is going on. But know that your thoughts and the positive feelings that you're giving towards them, the prayers and encouragement that you're sending, one time balances out, they will be able to reach out to you. And if you're the person grieving, if you're not able to connect with everyone and be able to let them know what's going on, it'll be okay. Relieve yourself from that pressure. You cannot talk to everyone. You cannot connect with everyone at the same time. It will work out one time. It's good. I had no idea that the night that Mark died, that Chris was walking the street at night in her neighborhood, just overwhelmed and just so disheartened. I'm glad to have the conversation and to hear how she felt because still now for me, it does something for me to know that my friends and my family were just as disheartened by the situation as I was. Okay, so if I do this outside, I need to really stop looking around. I gotta focus on this, sorry. Not used to this. But, and I came to the conclusion in listening to the conversation again, how heavy and how difficult it is and how essential and critical it has been for my friends and family that have shown up. I think now that their way of showing up and carrying this burden has made the load bearable in ways, looking back in retrospect, that I didn't think about at that point in time. I really hadn't considered how vocal I was in sharing how I felt. But looking back in, in retrospect, it was important. It was really important. And I see now that those conversations have led into the widowhood and given them a voice to be able to talk and share in a way that would have never been possible. Another thing that, that Chris talked about is how life gets hard. And you don't always just get to stop and do everything that you want to do. When they had to leave me and go back to Virginia from Pennsylvania, every time someone left, it felt like they were literally leaving me. It was not just them leaving to go back to where they lived. I felt like it was another person leaving and keeping me in the situation. And there was so much of me that wanted to leave too and not be stuck right there. I am grateful for my brother that stayed for a couple of weeks. And I'm also grateful for my cousin that came. But what did they eventually have to do? They had to leave too. And I want to encourage you that yes, people that came there and put their life on pause in the initial part of your grief process, they do have to go back to their life. It doesn't mean that they don't love you. It doesn't mean they don't support you. It doesn't mean that they don't care. It's just that they have responsibilities. Just like there was a point in time where you may have showed up for somebody in their grief and then you had to return to your life. Your feelings about that, be honest with yourself. Maybe that's an opportunity to open up your journal. And even if that happened a year ago, or two, three years ago, or just maybe months, and you're going, I did feel like that. That it may help 
to be able to write down your feelings, whether you write it in a journal or you do it audibly and talk about how you felt when people had to leave. Because when you release those feelings and that tension, it may make this journey a little bit easier for you. That one of the other things that Chris talked about is not trying to make it easy. She couldn't make it any different. The situation is what it was. She didn't try to come up with a witty, candid statement. She didn't try to come up with a fix for it. She just sat with me in the process. And that right there is important because a lot of us, we don't want to see the person that we love. We ourselves don't want to be hurting, but there is no automatic fix for grief. There is no automatic fix for the person that we love no longer being in this world. It is a process and it just takes going through whatever that process will look like for you. Some of you will maybe never go back to work. Some of you may go back to work the day after the service. Some people may throw themselves into exercise and some people may throw themselves into volunteering. Some people will find reading. Some people will say, now that this person is not here, I may do X, Y, Z. Some people may be sad. Some people may start in being part of a community of widows. They may go to a support group. They may find a therapist. But whatever it is for your process, I encourage you to not try to just stuff it down and act like it doesn't exist. The person you love is no longer here and it hurts. And I encourage you to lean into it. I remember one of the things that was difficult for me is waking up in the bed that Mark and I had slept in for so many years and he was not there. And I remember waking up going, huh, I'm alive again today. And I would wake up, I wanna say like that first year, every day thinking, huh, I won the life lottery. Look at that, I'm alive another day. Hey, sweetie. Hello. Hi. On um, my podcast, you want to say hello? Hi. Hi. Hi to Sunny. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi to Sunny. Nice, thank you. What? Huh? It's Josie. <laughs> so, I forgot what I was talking about. Um. People are grieving all around us. And the unfortunate part about grief, most of the time, it's something that is in our mind. And nobody else can see it. Nobody can see when I was at Sam's Club for the first time without Mark and walking into that and in tears and disheveled in my mind. No one can see that when I went into Sam's Club that Mark was the person that would do the shopping and I was just there for all the free food tasting on Saturday. No one could see how difficult that was. But if I would have gone into Sam's Club with my arm removed and I was trying to push and go shopping the cart with one arm, people would have been running up trying to assist me. But that's not the thing with grief. Everybody around it cannot see it. They cannot see how disheartened that you are, how difficult what seems like an everyday little task is in comparison. So that is why it's important for the people that you can articulate that to, for them to know. Because throughout life, you were spending days showing up, trying to put on a good face for life and act like all these little steps don't hurt. And they do. Grief is hard, grief is difficult, grief is to be valued. And when Chris said, I wish we could skip out on it, I was like, yes, baby, please. And another thing that she talked about was grief brain fog. Can you relate to that? Cause I can, oh my gosh. Sometimes I could not think of anything past that current moment. It was daunting, it was shocking. 
I literally thought I was losing my mind from the way that I could not um, facilitate thoughts together, the way I could not make decisions, the way I kept thinking, this Mark's dead, what does that mean? And one of the things that I used to do, I kept a little memo pad, a little flip pad, just small enough to fit in your pocket of your pants. And I would write down in the morning things that I needed to do. And then I would line through them as I completed them. I would go through, go back to that throughout the day about things I was going to do because I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't think about what the next task was. And I remember taking so much time to just pause and just sit there and deep breathe because I couldn't comprehend. It seemed like the world was moving super fast and I was going in slow motion. But the world wanted me to move fast, but I couldn't keep up. I couldn't comprehend the connectivity of one thought to another. And I needed to find a way to deal with that. And then I started parceling off things that I didn't need to do. They didn't get done. It was like, that'll wait till another day. The phone calls that I needed to make. Every phone call, I would have to call and cancel a credit card, uh, change utilities, any administrative thing, deal with a couple of items that were in probate. Having to say, my husband died and looking at those death certificates and I didn't even know death certificate was a thing it makes sense because you have a birth certificate so there would be a certificate for your death but having the right amount of copies of death certificates having the right ability to articulate to say that I am his surviving spouse in those conversations every time I had to take care of business was gut-wrenching it was it was too much and what i would recommend based on my experience i did too much sometimes every day and it left me emotionally drained looking back and where i am now i would tell tina pace yourself out one item a day is sufficient you don't try to try to get it all done in one day because each one of those phone calls each one of those experiences took something out of me that I wasn't really thinking of. I was considering just handling business and going about things as I normally do, but I was no longer as I normally was. So I caution you if you're trying, if you are doing a couple of things a day and you find that you are just depleted uh, mentally and just exhausted, maybe flip it to once a day, maybe twice a week. The unfortunate part is our loved one is not here and it's not a rush the thing that we would have wanted was for their existence those administrative things will get done in my mind i just wanted it to be over with and as i look back it's never over with it is forever different so rushing through those tasks don't did not serve me well if that's a bit of advice i can share with you Pain of our loved one sometimes is unreconcilable, unconsolable. And that can be a scary place to be. I have talked to some people that they have said that they are afraid to really take in the amount of grief and the amount of hurt and pain that has caused by their loved one absence because they're not sure if they could pull themselves out of it. I get that because it is a pain like I've never thought or never had or never experienced in my life. And it's not even something that I think I can properly articulate when I say how painful it is or it was. The pain now, six years later, is different than the pain at that moment in time which is why I've wanted my friends and my family to share with you from their perspective because for some of them, it's like a flip of a switch and the memory is crystal clear. When I have the conversations with them, it brings it back to a level that I didn't even know was possible. But please understand, it's hard. 
you may not be a person that cries. That's fine. You don't have to guilt trip yourself into saying that my pain is just as much as somebody else, but don't, because I don't cry and guilt trip yourself about it. You may be a person that cries all the time. And there may be somebody right next to you that doesn't cry. I encourage you not to compare if your pain is more than the other person because of what you see outwardly. No one can particularly measure someone else's pain. Even the person grieving cannot measure their pain based on tears, the way they see them show up or not show up. Some people process it differently. Some people function differently. But no, if you have lost a loved one, it hurts and it has changed who you are. There's a part of us that we want to go right back to being who we are after the first year. After the first year going through the anniversary of their death, going through birthdays, significant events, and we get to the end of the first year and we go, okay, I can do this. I want to tell you, not so much. That first year is a big thing to be able to accomplish, absolutely yes, because you survived the first year of their passing. But from every person I have spoken with, that second year is harder. It hits you in the gut because the reality of their absence is surreal. At this point, you may have gotten through a lot of the administrative things. You may have accomplished a lot of your requirements. Now becomes the work of living everyday life in their absence. And that is a part where you can start feeling like you are alone. Because your friends and family have done that woo-ha first year journey with you. And some, in your mind, you'll start saying, well, it's the first year. I can't keep talking to people about this. The first year is over. You may even have some people say, aren't you over that yet? And, and, and what are you doing? Yeah, they have not experienced grief. It takes more than a year to get over it. And so I encourage yourself to give yourself grace. I encourage yourself to give yourself mercy and understanding as you go through that process. And, and know that it is a process. I hope that these conversations have been helpful for you to know that there are other people that understand how you feel. I feel like on this Saturday sit down, I kind of rambled a lot. Hopefully I caught up with all of the different points. I feel like did what's on the paper and it's definitely been enjoyable being outside. I'm gonna try to do this more often and try not to be skittish looking around. Thank you for being here today with me. Enjoy your Saturday. Bye.